and I am a presidential ambassador here at Colorado State University. I am majoring in international studies and ecosystem science and sustainability. And I'm gonna pass it off to my fellow ambassador, Lucy. Yes, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. As Ali said, um, I'm also a presidential ambassador. My name is Lucy um, and I am a senior here at CSU studying English, um, but I'm also on the pre-med track. So um, an interesting combination <laughs> for sure. Um, but we're just so excited to have you all here and to hear from Kelly and her wisdom. Uh, so Ali's gonna start us off just by explaining what this career connection is gonna look like. Yes, so the Career Connections uh, liberal arts session today is going to continue with our live interviews and we'll be primarily producing them for alumni, friends of the university, uh, for those in a variety of fields. Um, we hope our students and alumni are able to use these informational interviews as learning tools for deciding their desired career path or learning about a new industry or even a skill. If you're interested in connecting for further mentorship after today's interview, we have avenues to do that as well. Yeah, so now we're, we're gonna jump right in. Um, we are very blessed to have Kelly here with us today. Uh, Kelly is the mom of three uh, students, one that is actually a graduate of CSU and then one who is at CSU right now and another who's taking a gap year. So uh, she knows CSU well. And we're just so excited to um, have you here, Kelly, and kind of share your experience and your wisdom with us. Um, so my first question is just, um, if you can start by just talking about your, your academic journey a little bit, uh, what was your, your path um, during college? And then well, how has your path looked now? And um, how has it brought you to where you are now? Well, thank you, Lucy and Allie. And thank you for having me here today. Hello, everyone who's here live and those that will watch on a rebroadcast. So as Lucy and uh, Ali have introduced you to sort of my, some of my background, it would take quite some time to go through it all. I'm, I'm actually quite senior now about, hmm, gosh, I graduated in college in 1988, so date me a little bit, but um, have had a wonderful journey and I'm happy to share a little of that with you. Um, but my connection to CSU is through my daughters. Um, I'm not an alumni of CSU. I'm actually an Idaho vandal. If anybody knows where Moscow, Idaho is, way up by the Canadian border in Idaho, a very small but um, wonderful state school in the state of Idaho, which is where I was from, is where I attended my undergrad um, education. That's where I obtained it. And um, amazingly, um, in many ways, a little like we were also um, the land grant institution of our state in Idaho. So I had some similarities and experience that way um, with a lot of ag students there, but I took the liberal arts um, approach and I graduated with a degree in organizational communication, which I'm pretty sure my parents said, wait, what? Um, so kind of a first generation um, grad myself, my father did get a theology degree, but uh, late, late in life. So it was somewhat of a new experience for the whole um, you know, kind of everyone going off to college thing of my generation. But um, so I am a liberal arts undergrad degree and I went on um, to have a business um, experience for about eight years and decided to go to law school later in my 20s. And I became uh, a practicing lawyer. I always wanted business to be part of my trajectory. So I became an in-house counsel with um, Boise Cascade Corporation in Boise, Idaho, which um, back then was in all kinds of things, not only timber and paper, but also office products and sort of worked my way around there. And I've been an in-house lawyer now for, well, since 1995. So um, I've taken the role of sort of liberal arts undergrad to my law school education. And now I've been sort of that business communications law combination ever since. So um, that's sort of my educational trajectory. And I'm really excited to share a few thoughts today about lots of things and take any questions. Um, I know we'll have time for that. Um, I should tell you, I also serve um, as the chair of the board of CSU's Parent and Family Programs Board. And it's so much fun. It's a peer-to-peer -peer network where we get to put out communications to our peers, which are the family uh, of all of the CSU alumni and students. So 
And that's been really fun for us. So that sort of brought me to today's uh, session, even though I'm not a graduate myself of CSU. So um, anyway, so that's my trajectory. As to what I do today, I am um, general counsel for a rare earth mining company. And I became a mining lawyer, um, let's see, 2005. Um, but before that, I was in construction. So um, I've taken a somewhat unconventional role uh, as a female working in business, and it's always been uh, wearing a hard hat. And I really love that. And I encourage everyone to consider, you know, sort of industries maybe outside of the norm for where you're coming from with a liberal arts degree, whether it be history or English or, or, or in my case, communications, and think about where that fits into wonderful industries that may be a little off the grid or something that's not as traditional as others are thinking about. But um, with that, um, that's my educational background. Um, I know I got a lot of books behind me and I, I think I was just telling Lucy and Allie, don't think I've read all those books because I can't. As a lawyer, you know, most of my reading is very technical reading and a lot of brief writing and litigation things. Uh, this here is my claim to fame. Decisions from the U.S. Supreme Court. I actually was blessed to take a case to the U.S. Supreme Court in 2009. And uh, at that time, my three daughters were very small and they were sitting right there in the courtroom. And I know the Supreme Court's been in the news recently, but let me tell you, if you ever have the opportunity and you're in D.C., do pop in and watch an oral argument because it's exciting, it's very intimate, it's very small, and um, it is open to the public. So, um, that's kind of my claim to fame on the lawyer side, um, but nonetheless, um, being an in-house practicing corporate counsel is really where I spent the vast majority of my career. Thank you so much for that, Kelly. Some very interesting tidbits in there that I'm hoping we will be able to touch on a little bit later. Initially, you did mention that you went to law school a little bit later in your 20s. Can you kind of explain why you decided to go to law school and um, what your initial motivations were? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, I do some mentoring for young lawyers and also pre-law uh, hopefuls that are either start studying for the um, LSAT or considering law school as a trajectory. So I'm certainly happy to field any questions if those are out there for those that are viewing um, this webinar. But yeah, so business was always uh, near and dear to my heart as a, as a communications uh, major, you know, it wasn't really specific to journalism. It was really about how you can take entities and you can use communication tools to sort of better the result and the return on investment while improving the employee uh, and customer, you know, relationships, right? And so I've always found communications to be interesting. And I remember taking a um, a class um, in, and our things have changed so much. I mean, let's just be honest, we didn't have Google, right? We didn't have the internet. We didn't have any of that when I was studying communication. So communications today is so different, but it comes right down to that personal touch. And that's something I'd like to leave everybody with today. You know, as much as we have these you know, phones, mine's sitting here and we've got Zoom, thank goodness with what's going on with COVID today, we do have these communication tools but there's just no replacement for that personal relationship that you develop. And that was always exciting to me um, in my undergrad experience. But I think in the back of my mind, I always knew I wanted to go to law school. I wasn't sure that I wanted to be a practicing lawyer because um, let's be honest, that can be a little boring at times. Uh, more times than not, my daughters would come into my office and they'd watch what I was doing with a really long lengthy contract. And they said, ooh, I would never want to do that. And, and I didn't blame them because that wasn't the side of being a lawyer that I was seeking to obtain through my education. So after a little stint in the business world in a family business where I had the um, absolute blessing of having a lot of responsibilities early, um, I realized that going to law school would just increase the tools in my toolbox. And I had no intention whatsoever of actually becoming a practicing lawyer in terms of the traditional you know, litigation sense or working for a law firm. That was just not something that I was excited about. But I did know that by getting that degree and going through the education of law school, that I would kind of um, up my game a little bit. And I would understand some critical thinking that I could, you know, I touched upon in undergrad, but I wanted to take it to the next level. 
So I did go to law school. And uh, by the way, it was a very small, you know, not selective law school. It was the University of South Dakota, if you can believe it. So I went from Idaho to South Dakota, right? And, um, and it, it ended up being the best thing I ever did. I graduated from law school and I knew that I had increased my ability to be a better employee, worker, contributor for the rest of my life, no matter what I did. And as it turned out, I found my niche right away in practicing law in-house to be a company's lawyer, as opposed to your more traditional, if you will, or often, you know, the route folks take out of law school is they join a law firm. And I had no desire to do that. I had done that during my internships and wrote a whole bunch of briefs and stood in front of judges and shook in my shoes. It really wasn't my comfort zone, but I knew that experience would take me into my career as an in-house lawyer. And, and, and as, as a mom of three daughters, I knew that having work-life balance would be important. And I believe that being an in-house counsel would allow me to do that and it has, it has over the years. Thank you so much for that. That's, I love, I love that um, you went into it, not um, knowing that you were gonna end up being a practicing lawyer. And I think so often, especially as students, we're so afraid of trying to figure out our whole career path at once. And we don't realize what's going to be to become as we just develop as people and go through the world. So I love that. Um, do you have any encouragement or do you have any things that you would have done differently knowing what you know now? Um, maybe like when you were just graduating from college or after that? Oh, boy, how long do you have, right? So, you know, I heard once from a speaker that there's a reason, how does it go? There's a reason that the windshield is so much bigger than the rear view mirror, right? That's one of those things I try to remember. Even at my age, you know, I'm, I'm middle-aged now and I look and I think to myself, you know, what's out there in front of me and not necessarily what's behind. But I do think it's always a good idea to stop and contemplate about these things, mostly because if there's something we can share of those that are feeling like they have to have everything planned out, that maybe sharing some of that rear view mirror is important and I'm happy to do that. Um, one of the things I think, Lucy, you just mentioned, and it's so important is I'm a planner. You know, I've got sticky notes everywhere. I've got the daily plan, I got the weekly plan, and I've got the monthly plan. And early on when I was in my undergrad education, I, was into everything. Everything was scheduled and I loved all the engagement. I, I'm envious of those still in college because what a neat opportunity for you to reach and touch and experiment with different things, different clubs, different organizations, different leadership roles. Um, and don't, don't miss a minute of that. But one thing I think as you look after your undergraduate degree and you say, you know, this is what I'm going to do, boom, boom, boom. I think my, my biggest thought was is Looking back myself, the minute I let go of that and experienced my trajectory as it unfolded for me, um, I would have slept a little better early on if I had known now or then what I know now. And that is, you know, put yourself out there, try these things, but don't be too married to a particular trajectory. When I, when I went to law school, I think I mentioned that I had planned on getting my law degree and potentially uh, returning to a family business. And and here's how that played out. I was doing an internship in Rapid City, South Dakota for a litigator because I wanted to make sure that litigation wasn't going to be my thing. And they threw me to the dogs. And boy, I'll tell you what, that was one heck of a summer and I didn't sleep at all. But back then there was no internet, remember that? And I read a local newspaper in Rapid City and it said they were looking for an in-house counsel in Boise, Idaho, Boise Cascade. And I thought, huh. Now, that's not really what I was going to do, but I'm going back to the family business to, to be in business. And so I made the outreach and guess what? I returned to Boise, Idaho and started a wonderful in-house counsel career. But had I not sort of been open to that when I saw it and put myself out there, I would have had a very different trajectory there. And similar things have happened over the years. And I think you'll have a lot of folks that are mentors for you um, in your own life. And they're going to say the same thing, right? left turns, right turns. But I think my biggest advice on that, as I look back, is be open to changes and opportunities. You know, if COVID and 
2020 has taught all of us something and we'll never forget is that you have to remain flexible and resilient. And when things don't necessarily flow how you have planned it, whether it's what happens after you're done with your undergraduate degree and you really wanted to work in one particular area, that may or may not come to fruition given everything in our world today, but you'd be open to other opportunities and you'd be amazed how that straight path kind of winds a little bit, but you still end up in a pretty wonderful place. But I think a lot of it's your mental state about it. And I think my advice looking back for myself now is I wish I would have known that before, right? Um, the other thing I think looking in that rear view mirror is I would have gotten up earlier in the morning. <laughs> I'm just saying <laughs> Right? Uh, I, I learned that later in my life when I was um, in a very big job. I was general counsel of a major mining company internationally for many years. That was the same company that took me to the Supreme Court. And I probably got about four hours of sleep a night for many years. And I used to think, wow, you know, how can I sustain this and everything? But I was the first into the office in the morning. I was the last to leave at night. And for some reason, that just really developed a whole new sense of work ethic for me. And I think, you know, if you look at it that way, and if you really put yourself and work hard and have resilience towards it, I think things will unfold. And sometimes patience is important. I've never been patient with myself. So have patience along the journey. I think those are the things that I think. Yeah. Kelly, thank you so much. I personally, as an aspiring lawyer, have already picked out that many nuggets from you. And I was a bit curious about your current role at CSU for the parent and family planning program as well. Could you speak to how you got involved in that? Um, what your daughter thinks of that, having you in that role? For sure. You know, it's amazing when you really feel things back from a different angle. So as a parent, um, you know, I, I've always been a fan of things that have gone on at CSU from a, well, from different levels, you know, um, everything from you know, my one daughter was a ram handler, right? And I would be at the football games and I was just amazed at, at the energy. And I, I, feel, I feel a little badly for those that are new freshmen this year, right? They're not having that same experience, but it'll return. So be hopeful and just be diligent and stick in there because those were some of the really interesting and fun times to see the community of CSU, not just at football games, but just the energy around the family and home, you know, homecoming weekends and stuff. And so, you know, we really became quite excited about the energy and of course what we call the ramble, right? And how it extended beyond the students. So for all the students on here, you know, there's such a community, your parents are probably, or family members are probably very in tune with it as well if you've been at school for a while. And so being a part of that, I, I found myself kind of taking the initiative to reaching out to various folks in the uh, administration, be it admissions, or, or whatever and saying, hey, you know, I'm a family member and, and here's something I was thinking about that might help in this area. And, you know, it was unsolicited and I'm sure some folks said, you know, why is she sending us these notes and why is she popping in on our office? But over time, I found folks were very receptive to feedback. And then at some point, my name passed along somehow and um, parent family programs, which is amazing at CSU. I mean, really unprecedented what's going on at this major university has a program just specifically geared for parents and family members to make sure that all of the undergrads, all of the graduate students are fully supported. And when I met um, John Henderson, the head of the program and assistant dean of students, I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I really want to help with this. And of course we're an all volunteer board and we're only a couple of years in the making, and we're already having a, a really wonderful time reaching out to our peers. And for example, today, some of you may have even seen the RAM Connections newsletter come out. It went to all family and parent program uh, people on the email list, and it talks about career networking and a lot of the things that you've been talking about with this career connection series, you know, and, um, and that's just another thing we do on the board. So Again, we have a, a website, we have an email address um, through parent family programs, and we try to do targeted communications to make sure that you, the students, are best supported and that parent and family members are a part of that support. So that's what the board's all about. I, I'm absolutely honored to serve on that board and um, appreciate the fact that you've given it a shout out here. So. 
That's great. I love that um, you just took the initiative in that. And um, I think it's a very needed thing at CSU to have that connection and especially to have family members feel like they're a part of that support system too is huge. Um, I have one last question for you. Um, you mentioned being a woman in a more non-traditional role and like I'm hoping to become a doctor, another non-traditional female role. And I know there's probably a lot of other people out there that have similar experiences, um, what would you say to them? Or um, how, is it, how has your experience been different um, because you are a woman in this, in this field? Well, that's a great question, Lucy. Thank you for asking it. And, and yeah, so this goes, you know, this goes uh, for whatever gender you identify with or whatever. I mean, I think this is part of our story. Um, you know, when I joined um, mining, first of all, even law school, I, I was at the time, I, I was in the minority. I think, I think there are more females now in law school than there were. In fact, I heard my, my, one of my daughters is going through the law school admissions process and they're actually giving good scholarships for anybody interested in law school. They're giving good scholarships for law schools. And I didn't know that. And frankly, when I went, there was no such a thing because it has to do with supply and demand, I'm pretty sure. But nonetheless, um, you know, I've always, I think I, I mentioned I grew up in a family business and it was construction. And at 12, I was a water girl, you know, I was out on the um, job sites and I was running around seeing if anybody needed a runner or whatever. And, and I embraced it early. Um, I also have three brothers, um, mostly in the engineering side. So I was kind of the one off here that wasn't interested in engineering, but more interested in liberal arts background. Um, so you know, I think it's what made my trajectory special and unique. And I really invite everyone to think about that because how do you distinguish yourself, right? And so back in the day, you know, I would be the only female in the room um, most often. And, um, you know, I found that to be a challenge, mostly just because of how personalities and sometimes gender roles can, you know, be a little different. But I wonder, you know, if we really thought about it and we think about some of the non-traditional trajectories, um, if you don't find new opportunities, but one thing's for sure, you have to have resilience, especially with me in construction and mining. I would show up to mine sites in, you know, the middle of nowhere, Chihuahua, Mexico, or down in um, Southern Argentina or um, in the Patagonians in Chile, and, or maybe even Australia. And I would show up on these sites and, you know, here, I'm 5'2", by the way, I'm very short. And I would have a hard hat on and I started joking I was going to paint it pink and, and see if I could, you know, make my way in to the whole conversation a little bit. But, you know, over time, this became amazing for me because I gained the respect of all my coworkers, regardless of backgrounds, identities, et cetera, to just be a part of the team. And it took many years. I will, I will tell you, the resilience was big. I can remember many times coming home and being very upset that I had been treated differently or maybe not so great in the workplace in terms of, you know, sort of, I wouldn't call it bully behavior, but you know, just why is she in the room and things like that. And I considered that kind of my badge of courage. And, you know, they just say it takes a little courage and I just stuck it out and I was rewarded beautifully for it, not only with my opportunities for responsibility and making a difference in my career, but also in compensation and just, just all the ways you want to feel good about the work you do. So if, if you have a question at all about, you know, those non-traditional roles and stuff, I will tell you right now is a great time to consider construction. It's a good time to consider the mining industry and, you know, just maybe a little outside the box. If some of your traditional trajectories look a little closed or not as opportunistic right now, right? So, I mean, that's a really good question. I, I see one come through here, Lucy, if I could. Um, somebody asked about work-life balance. So I think there was a little question come up I just popped up that I saw. And, um, you know, sort of on that same topic as, you know, being a female in a male-dominated industry, et cetera, work-life balance is very important. And, Maybe this goes into that whole, if I only knew them, um, I would have given myself more credit for, you know, what it takes to have work-life balance. As a and this goes for, for working dads. It goes for anyone who is a caregiver for someone. 
you know, I would have been more forgiving of myself because I look back now and there were times when being a full-time corporate counsel or general counsel really took away from what I felt I needed to be doing as a mother or wanted to do. And then over time, I started figuring it out that it's okay to ask. And in today's environment, it's very different. And it's wonderfully different because you can go to your employer and you can say, look, I'd like to telecommute, aren't we all now? And, you know, I want to work from home on Fridays because there's soccer that night or whatever. And I think I would have asked more and I would have been more forward about it. But I do think today, it, you know, in the year 2020 versus way back in the 80s and early 90s when I was juggling it all, um, I think I think being able to ask and know what your balance needs to look like, you'll be wildly surprised what you're able to do and and not really have to choose. You can choose a work-life balance that allows you to be a professional and to work and to support yourself and your family while being a wonderful parent, family member, caregiver. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kelly. And thank you, Emma, for that great question. We also have a few pre-registration questions that we wanted to relate to you as well. Um, the first being, as a future career counselor, I was wondering what advice you would give to someone pursuing a career in the liberal arts as opposed to engineering, healthcare, et cetera. Well, that's a great question. And so I guess it depends. You know, I mean, liberal arts is sort of a big umbrella for a lot of different uh, trajectories and specialties. I consider liberal arts, and maybe, maybe I'm off base here. So I'll just call it how it is. I think liberal arts is a wonderful foundation for anything in it, okay? It, it teaches you things about how to communicate, how to be well-read, um, understanding the world in multiple facets. Um, I, I, I think I told you I grew up in a family of engineers and both of my daughters were biomedical science and they're science and, um, But here I am and I really am a, a fan of the liberal arts background, but I also am a realist. And I understand that when you graduate with a history degree or an English degree, you have to think seriously about where you want that to take you and start making decisions along the way, right? So does it take you to um, a graduate education? Does it take you into teaching, which is an amazing uh, career and a noble cause for sure. Some of the best friends I have are amazing teachers and professors. Um, or does it take you into business where you can take those skills and you can you know, apply them in a business environment? Um, some of the best HR professionals, and this is a wonderful career track, are, are folks that have these liberal arts backgrounds and they join and then they become certified in all these wonderful HR things. And HR professionals are really needed in our professional world today in business. Um, so, you know, I guess in terms of that liberal arts trajectory, you know, get your feet wet, right? And maybe, just maybe, instead of going straight onto a graduate program, if you're just toying with the idea, get a business job. And, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, it could be a receptionist. It could be in a junior person in the HR role. It could be someone who, I mean, you, you pick it. Um, someone who's working in the accounting function just to be well-organized. Um, some of my best opportunities for mentorship in my career have been folks that have worked for me originally. And I, I see no greater pleasure than to see someone who starts at the front desk or as my paralegal or something like that. And if they far surpass anything they thought that they could do. So, you know, training on the job, getting certifications, moving on beyond working with me to something that they really enjoy. And sometimes it just takes that first job and you kind of start figuring it out. Um, and so I really encourage everyone, no matter what your degree is, but you know, it's, it's a little different with a liberal arts degree than say, if you know, right, that um, you have your engineering degree and you wanna go work as a construction manager or something like that, right? You, you know where that fits a little bit better and a little closer, but with a liberal arts degree, I suggest everybody think a little bit outside the box. And your first job is not gonna be your last job. And if you do your job, it may not be your last job in that same organization. And in my example is the mentorships I've had for all of the folks that have worked with me. My greatest pleasure is when they outgrow that job as soon as possible because they move on to new skill sets, right? I love that. Thank you, Kelly. 
Um, our next question um, from our alumni and students that are watching is, um, they were interested in learning strategies concerning the challenge of creative income producing versus production. Well, that's a detailed question. <laughs> I can repeat that again. Um, so interested in, yeah. um, interested in learning strategies concerning the challenge of creative income producing versus production. Versus production. Well, this must be out of a treatise from a professor or something. <laughs> I don't know if I'm qualified for, right? Maybe I should ask some of you students to define that for me. Um, I guess I could take a stab at it. If we're talking about creative income, are we talking about things that you do sort of out of the creative process or maybe that are non-traditional? I guess I would almost have a question back. I mean, if we're really talking about non-traditional income, you know, potentials or what have you, then obviously, I mean, there's a lot of great examples of people that have been wildly successful um, in finding income streams outside of a normal, if you will, or traditional trajectory, right? Um, and I mean, I can think of a lot of different ideas where that would be um, for myself. What, what I've been doing now um, in my consultancy role is sort of finding new opportunities um, for things as I continue to mature in my uh, level of uh, professional experience. For example, board work, both on the nonprofit and for profit companies. And that would be sort of creative, if you will, and outside of a normal everyday show up to your job trajectory. So, I mean, maybe that's what the folks asking the question are getting at, but if I'm missing the mark, weigh in and let me know. No, I think that was great. It was, yeah, it was a little bit of a complicated question. So I think that was a great, great answer. And we are going to go on to the next one, which you've touched a bit on this, Kelly. Um, but they were wondering any advice, perhaps that you received from a mentor or somebody who you worked for um, as you neared undergrad and graduation is upon us and we're entering the working world. Or are there any nuggets or pieces of wisdom you would like to share with us? Well, that's a wonderful question. Um, and I love that these questions are coming in from the folks on um, our webinar today. So, uh, yeah, I, I have sort of a whimsical one to start with. So when I was a new lawyer, and oh my gosh, I'm so excited. I felt, I felt so good about it. I had this new lawyer job and I was so excited. And um, I passed the bar exam, good thing. And um, I went to my supervisor and I said, oh my gosh, you know, I'm a new lawyer here. This is so great. And I said, I want to go to this big lawyer seminar in February. And, um, it was the state bar thing, right? And I said, are you going? And he was quite, you know, more experienced than me. And he said, oh my gosh, why would I go to something like that? I don't want to be in the room with all those lawyers. And I just started howling. I thought, okay, that's good advice, right? <laughs> So diversify your interests and don't get too stuck with this particular group. You know, you think you're a lawyer, you got to hang out with lawyers, right? I don't even golf. I'm just saying. So I, I, I found that to be a little bit of a whimsical mentorship. But you know what? There has been some truth to that. Um, but on a more realistic basis, um, one of my mentors, and he has since passed, and I, I miss him every day, was um, my CEO at um, a mining company that I work for, an international precious metals mining company. And um, he was just, he was so big, and he just had so much to say, and he was so loud, and here I am, this little person, and, and he was a little, you know, overwhelming, and, and scary at times, right? And here's how I found this job. I was on an airplane, and I was sitting next to him, and somehow, we got to talking about what we did, and by the end of that flight, I had taken his business card and he said, contact me. He said, people that communicate like you, he said, I've got a place for you. And I kid you not, I did. And the next thing I know, three months later, I moved to North Idaho and became the general counsel, senior vice president of the organization. And I was shaken in my shoes, right? But later, as I tucked under him and learned a whole lot, a whole lot for the next 10 years, 
One of the things he used to say to me is, Kelly, he said, you are the best communicator I've ever met and that will never, ever stop you from doing anything you want to do. This is going to open doors for you. And I used to think, oh my gosh, I'm not the smartest person. I didn't know anything about marketing when I joined marketing. And I still am not exactly sure how a melt works and I'm not exactly sure how block rotation works. I mean, all the technical stuff that engineers would love and I, I felt like I just was short there, right? I never had that technical ability that some of my peers and coworkers had. But I'll never forget when he told me that because I thought to myself, really, I can learn that other stuff. But if you're a great community, if you can bring people together, if you can foster their ideas, if you can collaborate, you're going to be successful. The rest of it you can learn. And I think that was some of the best advice I got because it gave me some more confidence. I always felt like I was falling just a little short on the technical side of things, but that gave me the confidence to just ask a lot of questions, have an open mind, and try to use communication as what I would bring to the table. And it served me well for 20 years. So that's probably the best advice I've got. And it's part of what I want to impart on everyone who sees this webinar. If you can really hone in on that, you can learn communication skills. So part of my liberal arts degree undergrad in organizational communication, you know, back then you had to stand up and you had to give a presentation. Today, young people, you all stand up, you've got your PowerPoints, you just, you, you're so good at it. But if you really think about it, if you really practice that communication and you polish it, that's something that will work for your entire career. And it'll evolve through your career too, right? You'll get better at things, you'll learn things. Um, I think I mentioned, you know, being a bit in a, in a well, it's, it's, it's a tough atmosphere sometimes in the mining industry, you know, and you get followed at a little bit. And, you know, sometimes I'll be like, oh my God, oh, you know, shrinking and everything. But I learned techniques to de-escalate that and be able to leave a conversation that may have gone a different way had I not been able to de-escalate it. So one of the things I want to impart on everyone is, your communication early on is going to be very important to the rest of your career. And so when I was thinking about what I could talk about a little bit today, I, I did hone in on communication. And, and I think that's why. I think it, it goes through everything you do, right? Honest and open communication is so important, but more importantly, professional and polished communication in the business world. And to be completely honest with you, I mean, I have my own daughters going through this. And I see this because I hire people and everything else. I think communication today for recent graduates has gotten a little informal, right? You like just little things like what's your voicemail stand, sound like when a potential employer calls you. I cannot tell you how many times I've called a young, young person with a, a resume in front of me and I hear a voicemail. Hey, it's me. What you want? And I'm like, Whoa! you know, is this really something, somebody that we want answering the phones every day, right? And some of these things are just that maturity level of kind of getting beyond. But think about your own personal communication styles. How's your voicemail look? What does your social media look like? Because we all know that potential employers are looking at these things today. Whole HR departments are doing all of this. And I suggest everyone consider that level of professionalism, the eye contact, right? The eye contact's important. I would say the handshake, but you know, we're interviewing by Zoom today. So there's that. But these kind of things are getting lost, I think, in the more recent generations, not just this current one, Gen Z, but maybe a millennials a little too. And if we just put, you know, step back, that could distinguish you. That could distinguish you. And you might think, oh, you know, how important really is that? It really is about what I produce, but it's also about how you pre present your production, right? So I really invite everyone to think a little bit about that. It's from everything from your resume, to how you interview, but it's also little things. It's what your voicemail says about you. It's what your social media says about you. And I really encourage everyone to take a look at that. And by the way, a big pitch to the Career Center and the young alumni group, you know, there's amazing resources out there in terms of all of the written communication. But when it comes right down to communication, you know, how much of it is nonverbal, right? About how you talk to someone in a Zoom interview, how presentable you are. And 
I, I just encourage everybody to take a real hard look at yourself that way and say, hey, am I really presenting myself the way I want that person to see me as a potential professional, right? So keep that in mind. That's great. And we actually have a follow-up question um, from our chat from Emily. Um, and her question is, how often do employers look at social media and how important is it to have a robust LinkedIn? Yeah, great question, Emily. Here's the deal. Assume 100%. Make it easy on yourself. Assume 100% of potential employers are going to look at your social media. If you're public, obviously you can choose to not be a public, but if you're public, um, just assume they will. And even if you're private, assume that somehow it gets through. So again, uh, how many do they, how many HR departments really do versus not? I think statistically we're talking about, depends on the industry, but we're talking about maybe 40%. Um, when, when they're not really grappling for employees and um, maybe unemployment's up a little bit and folks, you know, they have more choices, they may look harder. Um, but I always say just assume 100%. You know, I got a Facebook account only so I could see what my daughter can post. Let's just be honest. I hope they're not watching. But, you know, because sometimes you need someone to say, that won't come across great when you want that job, right? Be, obviously, be genuine to your friends and all of that. But when it comes right down to it in the job search, um, be very careful about that because you need to be yourself and genuine, but professionalism is important. And, you know, LinkedIn is one other, and I know there's other um, sites for sort of that professional networking. I believe there's Handshake there at CSU, right? So those types of sites, you need to be extra careful. Um, but you also have to be yourself because that's what makes you unique. So I'm not suggesting you, you know, take away all the interesting stuff. Or anything. I'm just suggesting that you make sure that it's professional and that it's something maybe your mom or dad would love you, or you know, your aunt or uncle, or someone that you consider to be a mentor to you. Thank you. That's great, especially um, with things like handshake that are now CSU students are using. I think there are questions about what should that look like. So that's great. Um, and we have another question about um, anything you would recommend avoiding um, when entering the workplace. So for students that are maybe just graduating and looking into entering the workplace, what are some things they might want to avoid doing? Well, my very first job, I was 15 years old and I cut a whole lot of onions at Wendy's. I really suggest you that. It was really bad. Oh my gosh. I still tell that story to my daughters. I'm like, Really hang out a window at 102 degrees in Oklahoma and cut after cutting onions all night because that was really bad. But you know what I did? No job is under anyone. And that job taught me that I really wanted to work hard in my professional life so I could have a great career. And I think every young person needs to understand, you know, your first job is not going to be your last job, you know. Uh, and, and in my example, that was it. Um, so I really suggest that you know, don't worry so much about what that first job or that next job might look like in terms of your trajectory to become a lawyer, for example, in my case. The most important thing is what did it teach you and what did you learn from it? And did you show initiative to make something out of it, right? So for me, I cut all those onions and I thought, I don't want to be cutting all these onions all the time. So I worked myself up to cashier, right? So I can do um, and that's really my advice. I mean, that's a simple and kind of whimsical example, but I think you understand what I'm getting at. And that, and that is, don't worry so much about the end point so much as doing what you can with the beginning. Thank you, Kelly. I absolutely love that. And I've often found that the simplest advice is the best. So I appreciate that. We do have one last question that I wanted to ask you unless we get any more in the chat. So please send those in if you would like them. Um, when is graduate, when is aid to graduate degree recommended and when should you jump into the working world? Well, that's a great question. And there's no easy answer and it's different for everyone, right? In, in my case, um, that work for seven years in between my undergraduate and going to law school was invaluable. And I wouldn't have had it any other way. And I'll tell you why. It taught me what work was. It taught me what the work life outside of college is. 
It's not that you don't work hard in college, it's just different, right? So when I went to law school, no problem. I treated it like a regular job. I was working at seven and I was done at five and I never pulled all nighters and I never worried and I had a great and successful law school. Okay. And yet some of my peers who went straight on hadn't quite gotten that whole work ethic thing down yet. And so they were like, be calling me at two in the morning. Why are we going to do I was like, I did that at four o'clock today while they were not necessarily paying as close attention to their values, right? So that's one of my pieces of advice is if you're going to take time between undergrad and a graduate degree, absolutely do it. Get out there in the working world and, and, and but don't, don't get sidetracked either. If you're really keen on going to a graduate program, then set your sights on it. A lot of employers pay for those programs, right? So let's say you get on with a bigger company that offers those benefits. That's really important because graduate school is expensive. And so if you find a way to get involved with an employer, work a few years, and then take some of their, maybe you want an MBA, or you know maybe you want a, a master's in some teaching type programs, or public administration, or maybe you want to go to law school. A lot of times you can get that paid for, or at least your application is going to look quite impressive for your experience. Having said that, we're in a very different time today, and employment is difficult. It can be more difficult today, right, than just a year ago. And so continuing your education now may also be something you want to consider. Um, you will stand out later with a master's or a JD or whatever you decide to do, if you can pull it off. I mean, obviously, that's a lot of education with not a lot of income. So maybe consider a part-time program where you can work with them. Thank you so much for that, Kelly. That was great. Um, we don't see any other questions coming in, so we're going to wrap up. Um, thank you to all of our participants who came to tune in today. We so appreciate you being here and sending in your questions. And we're always trying to offer new and relevant career resources to our students and alumni. Um, so feel free to tune in to another one of these Monday Career Connections. Um, we'd love to see you. And also a big thank you to Kelly for sharing her wisdom with us, sharing her story and um, her time with us today is uh, we get to learn so much about what does it look like after college and what does it look like um, as we pursue our passions after we graduate. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your wisdom with us. Uh, also, a lot of our attendees are CSU Alumni Association members. And thank you so much for that membership. That's what makes this possible. Um, and if you are interested in becoming a men member or connecting with other uh, engagement opportunities, please just visit alumni.colostate.edu. But that's all we have today. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, attendees, for coming. And uh, we hope you have a great rest of your day. So go Rams. <laughs> go Rams. Go get them, everybody.